The U.S. Naval War College is a Navy's home of thought. Established in 1884, NWC has become the center of naval sea power, both strategically and intellectually. The following Issues in National Security Lecture is specifically designed to offer scholarly lectures to all participants. We hope you enjoy this upcoming discussion and future lectures. Good afternoon and welcome to the fifth Issues in National Security Lecture for this academic year. I'm John Jackson and I will serve as host for today's event. This series was originally conceived as a way to share a portion of the Naval War College's academic experience with the spouses and significant others of our student body. Over the past years, it has been restructured to include participation by the entire Naval War College extended family, to include members of the Naval War College Foundation, international sponsors, civilian employees, and colleagues throughout the Naval Station Newport area. I'd now like to offer the podium to Rear Admiral Chatfield for her welcoming remarks. Ma'am. Hello. I'd like to thank all of you who are here in person and uh, quite a few others who have joined us in our virtual environment. Thank you for logging on to our Issues in National Security lecture series. I'm looking forward to Professor Jim Holmes a wonderful lecture this evening, and I won't delay his start any longer, uh, but thank you again for your kind participation. We will be offering an additional 11 lectures between now and May of 2022, spaced about two weeks apart. An announcement detailing the dates, topics, and speakers of each lecture will be posted by our public affairs office. Our next event will be on Tuesday, December 7th, 2021, and we will commemorate the Pearl Harbor attack and the Pacific War with a fascinating lecture by Dr. John Maurer. Okay, on with the main event. Please feel free to raise your hand to ask questions or use the chat function of Zoom, and we'll get to the questions at the end of the presentation. I'm very pleased to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. James Holmes. Jim is one of the most prolific writers here at the college and is known by virtually everyone in the maritime security business. He holds the J.C. Wiley Chair of Maritime Strategy here at the college and previously served on the faculty of the University of Georgia School of Public and International Affairs. A former U.S. Navy surface warfare officer, he was the last gunnery officer in history to fire a battleship's big guns in anger during the first Gulf War in 1991. He earned the Naval War College Foundation Award in 1994, recognizing him as the top graduate in his class. The latest version of his widely read book, Red Star Over the Pacific, is a primary selection in the Chief of Naval Operations Professional Reading Program, and most recently he published A Brief Guide to Maritime Strategy. I'm not exactly sure why, but former Secretary of Defense James Mattis considers him troublesome. His talk this afternoon will explain why it is so hard for the U.S. Navy to prevail in strategic competition or war warfare in the Pacific, even though it remains stronger than its competitors. I'm pleased to pass the baton to a friend and colleague, Dr. Jim Holmes. Jim. Captain Jackson was my last boss on active duty. I think that tells you something about how long we've been around these halls. I mean, my very last boss in the, in the College of Distance Education, I thought, good grief, 26 years ago, I guess. So I, I thank you all for coming out. And I want to talk to you, not, I'm, not to, I'm, not, I'm not going to claim that China's Navy is made up of zombies. You'll see, I hope I will explain the rationale why, why I bring this sort of, this sort of madcap uh, uh, analogy into the presentation. Zombies are bad ideas that you run into over and over and over again when you, when you discuss maritime strategy, how to design a fleet that's big enough and capable enough to accomplish U.S. and allied aims in the wider world, and on and on. So, and it's, and it's, a, it's, it's something that I've encountered quite a few times in my life. Oh, see if we can get going here. This is, a pro, this is a project that's been going on for about 12 years when the, when the uh, South Korean journal Global Asia asked me and my, and my friend and co-author co Toshio Shihara to 
explain how to count the size of a navy. So we put together we put together an article in concert with Robert Kaplan, whose works you may have you may, you may have encountered. And we basically we basically concluded that it's not all a numbers game. You should you should not only count numbers of hulls, numbers of munitions, of manpower, and also sort of quantitative variables, but uh, but uh, but also count or consider the, the the power that you could put in place at the decisive place and time of battle, because that's where really where the rubber meets the road. So from there, why don't I just launch right into it and explain how how I get here from there. This is, uh, and I will tell you that, that over these dozen years, sometimes I feel like Rick Grimes. Of course, the, of course, the hero of the, of the Walking Dead on the American movie classics. Again, certain ideas about, about sea power, they appear over and over again. You know how it is when you fight zombies. You, you, shoot, you shoot down 10 of them and 100 more like them come, by, come behind them and ultimately you, you simply get swamped. Sometimes you feel like, sometimes you feel like that when you have this sort of this sort of uh, uh, debates about sea power. So here's here's a very simple agenda that, that I'll use this afternoon to talk to talk with you all and set us up for some Q and A at the end. First of all, strategy. Let's start with the big ideas. Successive administrations, arguably reaching all the way back to the to the Bush, the second administration, but certainly since the Obama administration, have argued that the United States should pivot to Asia. We should, we should unbalance our force to favor, to favor the Asia-Pacific or the Indo-Pacific, as, as we now call it. So I'll start off with talking about, about the big ideas behind that. Then I will consider, then I will consider whether the assets that we have put in the Indo-Pacific region are enough to win. Should we get in a tangle with China or perhaps with China and its partner, Russia? And lastly, and, and the, major, the major part of the presentation will be about how to win away games. It's really hard to win an away game, even if you have a very sizable, sizable and capable fleet uh, manned by, by, by skilled crews. It's still hard to win in somebody else's backyard, which is really, which is really what we face as we, as we go into the Western Pacific and face off against China. So first of all, strategy, as, as I said, I'll give the World College a little bit of a plug. These, these are our most recent uh, three maritime strategy documents. The one on the left was unveiled on the stage here in 2007, just about right where I am standing. They have the, this is a bar, bipartisan thing. Successive administrations seem to agree on the, on the dimensions of the challenge and the proper responses to it. But although, albeit as, as China, China's uh, maritime buildup has progressed, uh, th these maritime strategy documents have taken on incre increasingly worrisome and increasingly hard-edged overtones, as you, as you can imagine. But nonetheless, I, th I think there are some common themes. And in fact, I'm going to go all the way back to the 2007 document because I think it most uh, clearly and succinctly states what the United States sees at stake in the Western Pacific and, and elsewhere in the Indo-Pacific. First of all, the 2000 Maritime, 7 Maritime Strategy vows to stage credible combat power in the, in the region for the foreseeable future. I think we, could, I could, we can interpret this as saying that the United States is going to remain number one. The US Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard, the sea services together are going, going to remain number one in the region for the foreseeable future. Secondly, uh, in more operational terms, the document declares that the United States reserves unto itself the option to, to impose local sea control, to take, a, to take control of any body of water uh, in, in the region at times and places of its own choosing, preferably with allies, but, 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 but perhaps, perhaps not. It might it reserve the right to do this alone should, this, should it see the need. And lastly, this was, this, this was kind of a new, a new addition to, to this particular maritime strategy. The United States sea services see themselves as custodians of, this, of the system, the system of liberal uh, seagoing trade and commerce. This is something that's under threat in peacetime from uh, weapons proliferators, pirates, piracy, and so forth, and obviously in wartime as well. So this, this was a new ingredient uh, in, the, in the maritime strategy, and it's something that it's endured in the, in, the other, in the other succeeding documents that I showed just a minute ago. So this, I, hope this, I hope this gets us oriented in, to try to see what we are trying to accomplish in, in the Indo-Pacific and try to see whether we have a, a force structure, uh, manpower, and so forth uh, to, to actually make that go. This, is a, this, this was a document I really enjoyed uh, back in 2015 during the, during the late Obama administration. This Asia-Pacific mar maritime strategy a, a statement appeared, and it said, this is page one of it, it said, we, we we will fight for freedom of the seas. We aim to, to defend freedom of the seas against all commerce. Uh, in international law, no one owns the sea, with very small exceptions codified in, in the international law of the sea. 
this, this law of the sea is actually under challenge in places like the South China Sea and the Black Sea these days in particular. And the United States is trying to rally coalitions to defend it, to defend the principle that uh, no one owns the sea. That's what the Obama administration meant when they said we try to safeguard freedom of the seas. If we let that go, if we, if we admit the, the principle that a coastal state, because it is strong and ambitious, that it can own the sea, that's a really dangerous precedent to, precedent to set because if we let the if we let our competitors get away with it today, I can see no reason that uh, some some big ambitious coastal state might not do the same thing in the future, and thus and thus potentially un unravel the entire system. It, as I said, it's a bipartisan thing. This is out of the Trump administration, the, the Pentagon, the Pentagon, Pentagon confirming that again. The Indo-Pacific is the priority theater. It is theater number one in importance for the, for the uh, Trump administration as for its predecessors, and indeed for the, for the Biden administration thus far. We haven't seen too many documents come out yet because it's still the early days for the Biden administration, but they have been very stalwart about uh, saying that we will do these, thing, do these things in the Indo-Pacific. And I would expect to see that uh, codified in print uh, as, as they start putting out their own strategic documents. So what does that translate into? The, in practical terms, under the, ever since the Obama administration, this is basically translated into saying that we will unbalance the US force structure roughly 60-40 in, in favor of the Indo-Pacific. So some, some forces will go from other theaters, primarily the Atlantic theater, in order, in order to bulk up the force that, that, that's present in the, in the Indo-Pacific and hopefully give, it, hopefully give it some margin of superiority sufficient to deter aggression or win uh, if, if, we, if, if forced to it. Is that enough though? It's, I mean, it's, it's, and, and here, here we start getting into, into the difficulties. Measure, measuring sea power relative to your adversaries is a really, really difficult thing with tons of variables, uh, some, are, some of which are really concrete and easy to count up, other, others such as the human factor, which are, which are harder, to, harder to gauge. But, and yet that's the task before us as we try to match uh, policy with strategy in the Indo-Pacific and with operations and forces capable of executing that strategy. And this is where we start running into zombies. Again, bad ideas. Well, not, not necessarily bad ideas. They're just sort of the sort of partial ideas about sea power. It's sort of sort of simple mnemonics that uh, that various contenders to public debates will say: if if the United States uh, Navy is X, then it's good to go. It's it, it, it just radically over oversimplifies. Let me let me show you what I mean by that. The first the first of the zombies. The first of the the first of the the uh, dubious ideas out there. I would describe as the idea that he who spend, spends the most wins. If you if you go out in the, if you go go out in the public commentary, you will oftentimes hear the idea that the United States, the Pentagon spends more than the next X countries uh, combined. Usually, it's somewhere like ten or eleven or twelve, something like that. The United States, the idea being that if our defense budget is so big, we autom we automatically have enough combat power to go into regions where we need to go and prevail over our adversaries. Yeah, here you go. In this case, in this case, it's showing, this diagram was showing that uh, the United States spent a little bit less than the next combined 14, 14 countries. And again, this is a talking point that you run into over and over again, especially in election years, but also in years like this when we're trying when we're we are trying to figure out what the size and the shape of the future force ought to be and how much it's going to cost, how much we are going to spend on it. But I mean, they, I mean, think about uh, think about some of the things we. I mean, it's 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 expensive to be a global superpower like the United States, operating in theaters all the, all over the, across the globe, where our adversaries are, are are remaining mostly concentrated close to home, such as such as China, such as Ru such as Russia to it to an extent as well, but also. The systems that, that, that we have to buy in order to, to remain a global superpower cost a lot. This is, a, this is the USS Zumwalt, the first of uh, our, our three ship class, a, a highly advanced stealth destroyer sitting over at Pier 2, uh, I, think, I think back in 2016, they stopped in, uh, they stopped in briefly. That's a, that's a $7 billion asset. That's a lot of money. How about, uh, or how about our newest uh, class of aircraft carriers? This is a USS Ford off, off, the, coast, off the coast of uh, the east coast of the United States this summer, having uh, apparently successfully ridden out its uh, shock tests and, look, and looking, looking good. It's about a $13 billion asset. And that's before you put airplanes on it. That's before you put munitions, supplies, people on it. If you, I, think, I, think, I, think when you, I think when you consider all that stuff, which is essential to its uh, combat mission. You're probably looking at about a twenty billion dollar asset, not counting escort vessels and, and all the things that go into a carrier task force. Again, we're a worthwhile system, but one that really costs a lot and cuts it and cuts into that. It cuts into that uh, that uh, defense spending 
the defense spending that the figures that go into this uh, kind of this, this kind of analysis. Or you, and when, you, when you talk about putting airplanes on there, this uh, F-35C carrier-based uh, variant of our, of our stealth uh, air power goes, goes for about, I think, about $106 million a piece. So multiply that out by a couple of, a couple of uh, uh, squadrons. And again, you're adding billions to the, co to the cost of the, the whole itself. And then, if that's not enough, we are, actually, we are actually facing the need to replace our ballistic missile submarine, submarine contingent, which was built during the Cold War and immediately after. Uh, which is aging, which is aging, aging out because of the age of the, of the power plants and the, and the hulls and so forth. And, then, and, part, and by the way, partly this is happening happening within uh, eye shot up here over at Quonset Point in the, in the Narragansett Bay. The, whole, the hulls are being fabricated for this new Columbia class submarine class, uh, which will be the heart of our nuclear deterrent into, into, in the coming decades. Each one of these things, I think, runs about seven billion dollars a piece. We, we want twelve of them. Seven times twelve sounds sounds like eighty four billion dollars right there. And again, that's that's something that is really expensive, but we have to have it. The, this is the Navy's number one shipbuilding priority, and I think it just I think it just has to be that way. And uh, it's a I, th I think that uh, just just as for the for the wild guys on uh, the BBC top, at the Top Gear series, they they hired very high cost labor like the Stig, this professional dri driver who was always testing cars for them. The United States Navy does not hire does not hire low cost labor, unlike our adversaries. In fact, I think the estimates are something that, that uh, the China's PLA Navy can put about eight or nine sailors in uniform for this for the for the salary and benefits of one American sailor. So again, this this is something that this this is something that would cut into the differential between between U.S. defense spending and that of other countries overseas. And I think I, I think we need to we need to take care care of our sailors. And indeed, the Navy has always been uh, attentive to that. But nonetheless, the financial the financial impact is something that will cut into this idea that he who spends the most wins because it need not be the case. Again, this, uh, defense budget figures are meaningful, but they but they by no means tell the tell the full story. The second the second fallacy, the second zombie that I that I would bring to you, I think it would I would use this as the metaphor. The idea that seems to be he who weighs the most wins. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean, here's, here's Robert Kaplan again, standing right, right on the stage, like he was standing right over there a few years ago, talking about sea power. And he's one of the greats in the field, by the way. This is not, this is not a hit on Bob, but he, but he did say so. He did say this, and this kind of perked my ears up. He said, the, I mean, he made the point that the United States is a maritime nation and so forth. But then he said that the Navy is the largest in the world by far. The U.S. Coast Guard would be the 12th largest Navy uh, if, if you wanted to measure, measure it by certain metrics. Well, I mean, this, this was only about four years ago when he said this. At that, at that point, we were already debating when China's Navy was going to get, be, be larger than the United States Navy in terms of numbers of hulls and other, other metrics. So to say that it was the biggest by far, I mean, that, that wasn't true. Unless, I, unless, he, unless he's talking about something a little bit, uh, a little bit out there. This was a, this is something that would have come to to as a surprise to Captain Jim Fennell, uh, who a few years ago uh, through CMSI, the China Maritime Studies Institute, wrote a, wrote a, an excellent chapter estimating that China's that China's navy would number about 500 hulls by by the year 2030. And at the same time, in which we are trying to figure out how to get to 355 or even just over 300. So, it's, I think that. And, and by the way, the Pentagon this year, this is its uh, this is its 2021. Report on Chinese military power, in which the Pentagon basically he basically uh, uh, basically lines up with uh, Captain Fennell, saying that the Chinese Navy is 355 today, destined to be about to, about to 420 uh, four years from now, and hitting 460 by by the year 2030. And again, we're trying to figure out how to, how to how to how to match up with that. How well do we match up with that? So again, so again. What are, what, are we, what are we getting at? And, and here's, a, here's another great in the field, uh, Michael Hanlon down at the Brooklyn, Brookings Institution, rightly noting that the Navy has chosen to put more technology uh, in, into, into smaller number, numbers of hulls in hopes of generating sufficient combat power. But again, and here's where the rubber meets the road. He says, he, he points out, and this is, a, this is really the nub of this discussion, our aggregate tonnage is three times of China's. Well, I mean, I mean, size, I mean, size matters. I mean, it's, it's, we, know, we know that the United States, if we want to fight hundreds, if not thousands of miles away, our ships need, they need fuel storage. We need to bring all our stuff in, term, in terms of ammunition, food, and supplies. 
I mean, that, that's a, you, need, you need larger vessels in order to do that, as opposed to a coastal state that's fighting close to home, and which, which, which can fall back on, on its own basis uh, if, if need be. So yes, but, but again, I would say, so what? That is not, that is not necessarily something that, that gives the entire picture. For example, I mean, if, if, si if size, if tonnage is, is all that matters, this is, this is the most powerful warship on the planet. The Emma Maersk out of, out of, out of uh, Denmark, uh, a freighter that displaces about 550,000 tons or five times the, 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 the displacement of the USS Ford, the aircraft carrier that I showed a few minutes ago. Obviously, obviously that is nonsensical. I mean, that's just, that's just absurd. This is an unarmed freighter, but yeah, that's where the logic of, of, of simply looking at tonnage figures takes you. I'm kind of glad that uh, Coach Belichick took uh, Mac Jones and this guy when he was when he was looking for some combat power for the Patriots this year. But again, this guy's got but this guy's got bulk, but I suspect he doesn't have a lot of combat power to for the Patriots line or anywhere else. If this is the metaphor, I mean, if this is the metaphor for tonnage, if the United States is like this sumo wrestler, if the U.S. Navy is like this sumo wrestler, it has a lot of combat power and a lot of size. If, we, if that's the standard that we can meet, then I'm all, I'm all about that, especially if we can sling around the PLA Navy and give it a wedgie like he seems to be doing with this, with this young Japanese guy. But in any event, I would, I, I would submit to you that he who weighs the most need not win. Again, this is another valuable data point, but it does not tell the entire story. Here's, a, here's another one, and this, 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 of course, is the Great White Fleet steaming around the world in 1907 through 1909. This, was, this would be the idea. In fact, in fact, I would describe this as sort of dueling zombies, especially in election years. You, you get into this back and forth between, um, between the opposite sides of the aisle about numbers of halls. One side says numbers of halls are everything, and the other side says, seems, to, seems to deprecate the idea that numbers of halls matter much at all. First of all, and, and this is this. This is the sort of the key talking point that you get mostly in election years. The Navy is now smaller than it has been since 1917, which, which, happened, to be, which happened to be the time during World War I that the Navy set out to make itself a Navy second to none under the Wilson administration. So again, here's, here's political fact trying to take that apart. And it, again, this is something that comes up a lot. Here's Senator, Senator Wicker of, of Mississippi, a key shipbuilding state. Making, making the point again, numbers of halls are now smaller than, it, than in any year since 1917. It's actually 1916, that was the year that the uh, legislation was passed. I'm not sure where 17 comes from, but you get, the, you get the idea. We are now going back to being a regional Navy is the implication, simply because of numbers of halls. Now, and you, of course, on the, other side, on the other side, people will fire back. They will defend their ideas. This is Secretary, Secretary of the Navy, Ray Mavis, who was the Secretary of the Navy for, for President Obama's entire presidency. And here's what he has to say about this idea. He's, he's firing back about, about this talking point about 1917. And he points out, he says, well, you know, the, the 1917 comparison is pointless because ships today are so much more advanced than their predecessors from a century ago. And he's right about that. But, it, but again, when, when, you hear this, when you hear this kind of, this kind of claim, you never hear, hear anybody say, well, you know what? The strategic environment, the operational environment is not 1917 uh, anymore either. The, our adversaries have kept pace with technology and things are at least as lethal out there for navies as they were in 1917. I mean, for, for example, the, the, uh, the Chinese uh, PLA, PLA Air Force fielding uh, stealth fighters. This is not something that the Great White Fleet would have had to worry about. I think this, I think this is a use of history that's, uh, that is just not terribly helpful. Numbers, are, numbers do matter, I would say, but they are not all, all meaningful. And therefore, Please ask the please ask the tough the, the tough questions when you get it, when you encounter these debates or if you get into if you get into them yourselves and, and try, you know, try to get try, try to add some nuance to these discussions. I think that the, and the last one I will go through you before we start doing some geopolitics is the is the idea that sea power is all about ships. I mean the idea that you sort of flip over if you want to figure out who the strongest navy is you flip over in your uh, your copy of uh, Jane's Fighting Ships or your favorite uh, your favorite manual about th that lists. Uh, ships and weapons and so forth. Compare them, and you figure, and you know who it is. But this is an age of joint sea power. Uh, Land-based weaponry is able to reach farther and farther out to sea all the time, and influence influence events on the high seas. It's not just about navies meeting each other in action. The way the way the, the way the German and the British navies met at Jutland in 1916. I think this I think this is the sort of imagery that people have in mind. If there's a naval battle. You basically, you basically have two fleets that will meet offshore at a particular set of coordinates and have a gunfight. 
Well, that, that, that may have been true, true back then, but it is less and less true today, as, as, I'll show you, as I'll show you for the balance of our time together today. Because sea battle is more than, it, it, sea, paddle, sea power and sea battle is about more than fleets these days, and in fact, about more than navies. Air forces, strategic rocket forces, and other, and other forces can put units of combat power on battles at sea and thus have to be factored into the overall military balance in order to get any, any real sense of who might prevail if we get in, if we get in any fight. Just a, just a little eye candy for this, this line, this line of uh, missile armed uh, PLA Air Force or PLA Navy fighters can range hundreds of miles out to sea, all armed with anti-ship missiles to, meant to do the, the United States Navy and our allies harm. But it's, a, it's actually even a little bit, uh, it's, it's actually even a little bit more foreboding than that. Uh, China, China's military, the PLA, has developed the, a family of the first, uh, the world's first anti-ship ballistic missiles, the, such as this uh, DF-21D. These are, the, these are ballistic missiles able to reach hundreds of miles offshore and tar target moving, moving ships at sea from land. So again, land can reach out and help control the sea. There's, a, there's actually an even longer range variant. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, the, the, DF, the DF-21D has a range the Pentagon says of about 900 nautical miles. So that's enough to reach over Japan and into the expanses uh, outside the first island chain that we hear so much every day. The DF-26, a newer, a newer uh, anti-ship ballistic missile, Pentagon estimates this has a range of about 2,000 nautical miles. That would be enough to reach out beyond Guam and so they essentially start to, to meeting out punishment to U.S. forces head for, heading for the region west of Wake Island. So again, this is something that we, we, we really must figure into the naval balance in order to have a real sense of what's, what's going on out here. To, just, to, just to translate this into, into uh, geographic terms, this is, a, by the way, the, the, uh, if you're interested in missiles, uh, this is out of CSIS, the Center, of, the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington. That has a wonderful page about this. Here's what, here's what they show. Let me, let me trace out the, the missile arcs, looking out, looking out from Chinese uh, coastlines, just to show you exactly how far, what, what the threat envelope is for our maritime forces operating in the Western Pacific. Of course, the outer red arc, that would be the DF-26, and the inner one would be the DF-21D. Again, these are, these are being fired from Ch Chinese soil, and they can, re they can reach out uh, great, great distances and threaten to do us harm. So again, this is, this is something that we have to factor into the naval balance. It's not just about ships anymore. And of course, and of course, and of course the PLA Navy also means it maintains what you could call a two-tiered fleet. Yes, there's the standard battle fleet that looks a lot like our own, but at the same time, the PLA Navy fields lots of diesel submarines, all armed with anti-ship missiles, as well as uh, small crafts, uh, small surface patrol craft, such as this uh, Type 22 Hobay catamaran. Again, all, all armed with anti-ship missiles, suitable for lurking offshore uh, within, that, within that threat zone and, uh, and, doing, us, and doing us damage as, as we try to close in China, on China's seacoast, whether it's to defend Taiwan, uh, do something in the South China Sea, protect the Senkaku Islands, whatever the contingency might be. So again, this is part of that layered defense that we see China erecting, which I, I, I just like this one. This one's kind of garish, comes out of CSBA, the, the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments. But it, makes the, it does make the very simple point visually that as we close in on China's seacoast, we go from sort of a green zone to a yellow zone to a red zone as we, as we come in within reach of more and more Chinese uh, defensive weaponry. And, that's, and this is something, again, we, that we, need to, we have to factor in into any meaningful uh, assessment of the military balance. Thing, things I, and of course, China has done some really unconventional things in, in recent years, such as improving islands, basically dredging up islands and, and making military bases in the South China Sea, where they can anchor forward defenses uh, well out into that expanse in a way that they, that they could not uh, until recent years. They also, I mean, they also have a really un unconventional assets, such as the world's largest Coast Guard uh, and, and also a maritime militia embedded within the Chinese fishing fleet. We see this. We see this every day. The way the way that China, the way that China is able to merge these unconventional elements of sea power into their overall maritime strategy, in order to make it make the, uh, life difficult not only for ourselves but especially for our friends and, and allies in the in the region. So again, the, you have to consider these elements of sea power as well, and part and part of the overall force mix, to do any to do a good, a good comparison between ourselves and and the adversary. So again, just to just to just to sum this one up. Just remember, the strongest fleet need not win. We could be the strongest fleet and yet be outmatched by, by this array of weaponry that the PLA has fielded in recent years. The strongest force wins. It doesn't matter whether a unit of combat power at the decisive place in time comes from, from a missile from land or from a ship at sea. 
it's still a unit of combat power. And that's, that, has to be, that has to be part of the discussion as well. Because as, as Einstein once noted, not everything that we can count counts and not everything that, can, that counts can be counted. Some things we can count and some things we, some things we, really, have to, we really have to branch out and, 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 and estimate some of the imponderables. When you sum up, all, when you sum up these uh, sort of partial ideas or bad ideas, you get this kind of thing, again, from another one of the greats in the field of, of, of political science and international relations. This is John Mearsheimer, well-known pro professor out at the University of Chicago, has been for many years. In his, in his, mo in his, in his most famous and his most recent work, uh, The Tragedy of Great Power Politics, this, was a, this is what he says. He essentially says that the United States is 10 feet tall. The U.S. military is 10 feet tall. Let me unpack that and, ex and explain why he says that. Well, he says that the fact is, the fact is that, that China does not possess meaningful uh, military power today, which seems a little strange when you read the, when you read the news. But why is that? Because its, its military forces are inferior to those of the United States. He seems to think he's backing up his first point with that point. I have a, and I, I would like to spend the, the, the rest of our time together examining this claim because he concludes that Beijing would be making a huge mistake today if, if it tangled with the United States. So what he's basically saying is that, that if the Chinese military is still inferior to, to that of the United States, that China simply cannot win. Let's go, let's go through and see why that is not the case. I think that's a very, I think that's a very dangerous uh, uh, prescription that uh, Professor Mearsheimer offers. And I, don't, I don't think that uh, we ought to be taking that as a strategic guidance. Why? Because away games are hard and the United States military only plays away games. We only fight in other, in other people's backyards. Let's go, let's, let's go, as we start getting into this discussion, let's go, let's go to the best of all sources. Karl von Clausewitz, the grandmaster of strategy from, uh, from uh, 19th century Prussia and a, and a fixture in the curriculum here at the War College. Here's what Clausewitz has to say about uh, absolute and relative strength, which is really what we're talking about here. He says, I mean, this, this sounds sort of like buy low, sell high type stuff. The best strategy is to be very strong. Go to, go to Gold's Gym, you know, build, up, build up a lot of forces and, 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 and train yourself very well so that you are the strongest military force on the whole. But he also, but he also points out that uh, superiority is relative when you start talking in operational terms. Who actually wins battles? Who, who wins campaigns? Which is what he's talking about when he says, says the decisive uh, point. It is possible for the weaker point to be stronger at that decisive point so that it can win an engagement. For example, it's, I, have, I can't count all of you, but I, I, I wouldn't like my chances very much if I challenged you all to a fist fight here in the auditorium. But you know what? I, I, stay, I stay in pretty good condition. If I could catch you all as, as you exit from the auditorium going through that door over there, I might actually stand some sort of chance of actually defeating a, whatever fraction of, of you all I thought, I thought I needed to and I actually to, uh, to uh, accomplish my aim. So again, I could, be, I could be stronger at the decisive point, even though I'm obviously far weaker uh, in aggregate than you all are together. Here's what he says. That being the case, if you, if you build up the biggest and the strongest armed force, keep it concentrated so that you are actually at the scene in stronger force than your opponent. So again, this, this, this makes perfect sense. But again, he comes back and he points out that even if you were not uh, stronger in absolute terms, you can you can still be you can still be uh, stronger at the at the, the ooh, excuse me at the place and time of battle when you're actually going to face off against your adversary. Even in the absolute absence of absolute superiority, you can be you can be stronger when it matters and where it matters. So again, I think we can sum this up. A contender can be locally locally uh, superior, even though it is it is weaker in global terms. Now that that I think is the dilemma that is before the United States and its allies today. Let's turn our attention to the Indo-Pacific a little more specifically. Man, I, lo I love this. I love this view off of uh, off of Google Maps. You can very barely see any land at all, but that's okay because we know that uh, we know that zombies swim. They, they can swim to Asia and and plague us over there as well. Let's turn, let's turn to some, a little bit of geography. Always start with geography when you start thinking about strategy. The Indo-Pacific is, is a big theater, which is, which is quite apparent from this uh, map out of the, of the Fortune Atlas of World Strategy in 1943. It, it, I, I throw this up here because it depicts what Imperial Japan was trying to do during that war. Essentially, it wanted to carve out the Western Pacific and, 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 and Southeast Asia as a zone of Japanese uh, su uh, superiority, but actually, but actually suzerainty. And it, it would follow this, uh, this sort of uh, uh, rough defense perimeter, enclosing most of the Western Pacific and Southeast Asia. 
as a as a zone for uh, Japanese resource extraction as well as as well as political uh, supremacy as well. That's a that, that is a really ambitious uh, that that's a, that was a really ambitious strategy for a, for a small island state off, off the northeastern coast of Asia. But there is a bigger theater. That one's a big one. But there is a bigger theater. Let me show you that right there shows shows the waters that essentially that Japan had its eye on. The waters at the waters at the water shoreward of the first island chain, and the and then the waters reaching out to the second island chain and points beyond. But guess uh, and, and this is I, I would say this is a rough parallel with to what China is trying to accomplish right now. It wants to establish itself as the as the prime power in the Western Pacific, roughly within these same waters and skies. Guess where the United States military operates? What theater we operate in? I tell you what, this, this makes it this is, makes it really easy for China to concentrate power because they know that we are dispersed doing things all over the globe, whether it's the Persian Gulf uh, trying, trying to face down Iran, whether it's the Black Sea or the Eastern Mediterranean trying to, trying to keep Russia in check. We have, we have commitments all over the place, and thus we tend to disperse ourselves into packets of combat power, whereas our, whereas our, whereas our adversaries tend to stay concentrated and thus improve their ability potentially to, to, to fulfill that Clausewitzian axiom, axiom that you can be stronger at the decisive place in time, even if you're weaker. Yeah, it's, it's, one, it's one thing for Moses to come out off the mountainside with the commandment to remain concentrated, but it's really, really hard to do in practice, especially for a global superpower like the United States. Why is that? Well, I mean, it, it, I mean, if you think about the, if you think about the decision making that goes on in Washington and the White House and places like that, if as as you, as, as you gaze around the globe at all, at all these different uh, theaters, you're going to incur heavy opportunity costs if you if you if you decide to concentrate most or all of the U.S. military in, in the Western Pacific to face down China. Because, because every, every theater is going to have a constituency that's going to argue, that, argue against that. Politically speaking, it's going to be a very, very di difficult thing to do, as well as just in practical, practical terms, not necessarily being a desirable thing to do. Would we, would we want to write off the Mediterranean Sea, for example, for the sake of the South China Sea? These are some of the imponderables that, that, that face us. It's really hard for a global superpower to cut, loo to, to, uh, cut loose commitments for the sake of concentrating somewhere else. And I think that's a dilemma that's, uh, that, that's with us every single day. The tyranny of distance is a, is, a huge, is a huge thing. And this is a perennial factor inhibiting the United States from execute, executing a strategy at a reasonable cost. Here again, another map from the world, that, from the Fortune Atlas in World War II. Just basically showing, looking down from the pole, how hard and, and how convoluted and, and just simply how far away different theaters are from force, for forces coming from the U.S. east and west coast. Man, look at that! Just skirting around, skirting around the South Africa and, and Eurasia. It's just long. It's just long distance to get to get through. It's also convoluted territory that could be contested in wartime. It's just a really, really hard problem. We, are, we, we also have to we also have to have a base network to boost essentially to boost our power projection away from American seacoast. And this this by the way we'll go into those uh, cost calculations that we talked about a little while ago. This is the this is my favorite metaphor coming from basic physics for projecting sea power out from our seacoast. This is a, this is a, this depicts uh, the inverse squares law in physics. The idea be, the idea being that if you have a radiation source. The, the strength of that radiation diminishes not so, so sort of in a gradual linear manner, but it, but it goes off a cliff. It, de it declines by the square of the distance from the radiation source. And therefore, if you want to, if you want to, if you want to, if you want to propagate it further, you have to have some way to boost the signal. Our base network, our allies, and so forth are the way that we do that. And this is, this is another part of the, of the complications that face us when we try to mount superior combat, combat power, do all the stuff that we talked about in the maritime strategy in somebody else's backyard. So again, it's, 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 a, it's a one thing for cause of us to talk about the highest and simplest laws, but again, obeying these laws is very difficult. And this leaves aside the adversary. As we look at our adversaries, we know that the adversary is not a potted plant. The, the adversary is not uh, an inert mass on which we work our will. The, adver the adversary has every incentive, has as, has as many brain cells as we do, and has, has, has a desire to frustrate our strategies. And you can darn, bet, you can darn well bet they will do their utmost to, to balk our strategies. Think, uh, think about this. This is, a, this, is actually my, this is actually the face I usually see when I start thinking about an adversary who's very imaginative. Uh, this is a Paul, uh, or excuse me, uh, General Paul Van Riper, uh, who back in 2002, he was allocated during a war game, war game near, named Millennium Challenge. He was given essentially the resources that would, 
that he would have if he were if he were commanding the Iranian military, and he was facing off against the U.S. Uh, Navy carrier task force out in the Persian Gulf. He was so, he was so created with those forces uh, that he was actually he was actually able to defeat a U.S. Navy carrier task force, even though even though we would we would have thought that Iran was woefully outmatched by by such a by such an advanced force. Uh, although it worked out okay for the Navy because they just went back and changed the rules so that Van Riper lost and uh, everything was happy, but. In any, in any event, the red to the red team gets a vote, gets a vote in our strategy, and is undoubtedly going to cast that vote against our success. It's very hard. I mean, it's very hard to be like the great Bruce Lee and go into somebody else's dojo, like he did in Fists of Fury 50 years ago. And yet, that's sort of the that's that is sort of the task that's before us. It's very hard to go into somebody's home stadium where where, where the home team has the advantage. This is Texas A&M down down in the College Station, where they claim to have invented the 12th man. Basically, the morale and advantages that go to the home team, uh, the ability to harass the other team by yelling at them and disrupting their signals, all the, all the, all the advantages that the home team enjoys in football. Or if you, if you prefer uh, basketball metaphors, say the same thing goes in, uh, in Cameron Auditorium at Duke University, where as you, can tell, as you can tell, they are vicious, the fans are vicious, and again, can, it, can interfere, with, the, can interfere with, the, with the opposing team. So translate that into strategy. I mean, if the home team will have most of its manpower nearby. Its bases will be on hand. As I said, as I said, it will have large amounts of weaponry potentially on hand. These translate into an advantage over a visiting team such as ourselves that's coming from very far away. So, I, so there is a method to my madness in relying so heavily on sports metaphors. And it's a, it's, a, it's actually a free for all. I mean, it's. I actually, I actually love this because it, it shows just how lightly policed uh, uh, world. What is it? What are they calling it? WWE, WWE, uh, professional wrestling these days. There is nobody to police to police this game, this geopolitical game, and assume that and assure that both sides that both sides are actually going to play by fair rules. China or any home team will, will deploy all the assets at its command, and it, in fact, it would be remiss not to use all the advantages it has. Just as you, just as you hear with this this poor guy getting getting tossed out of the ring, and probably belted with a, a chair or something like that. That's how mil that's how military conflict is. Again, I can guarantee you. I can guarantee you the the United Nations or uh, the United Nations or anybody else is going to police this. Just as that uh, other ineffectual referee is standing in and watching all this happen. Again, the enemy gets a vote, and the enemy will almost certainly cast it against us. So let's uh, let me start closing us down, so we have time for a little Q and A. And I think we'll go to the best, uh, the best sort of for talking about maritime strategy. This, this of course, is a caricature of Mahan, our, our second president, or I'm sorry, our president twice during the, the 1880s and then the 1890s, our second president and, and served twice. Uh, he was the, the most influential American strategist of the 19th century, according to the, the British uh, military historian John Keegan. And it, it is often credited uh, with being the most influential nonfiction author uh, writ large in the entire 19th century in, in the United States. Here's what he has to here's what he has to say about this, and it, it's this is actually a really valuable little formula for thinking through it, for thinking through all these uh, these issues that I've raised with you and trying to dispel the zombies, trying to shoot them down and finally defeat them. He says, that if I'm trying to figure out how to size a fleet to accomplish its goals, so I'm, I'm facing off against a hostile fleet or a hostile force. Here's how I do it. And he sketches. He says it's a broad formula. First of all, there's sort of the net assessment type stuff, uh, comparing numbers, comparing comparing us uh, tonnage, comparing armaments, and so forth. So this would be the sort of net assessment type stuff that you think about when comparing navies, who has more ships, who has more aircraft, and so on and so forth. So that's a, that's clearly part of the part of the uh, the dilemma of trying to size a fleet. You have to you need to put enough assets on the scene in order to fight with reasonable chances of success against the largest force in which you are likely to encounter. So there's an element of risk in this. I, I mean, you have to think about your own risk tolerance. I mean, what, what is a reasonable chance of success? And I mean, how much how much of my force do I need to allocate in order to bring about something that's within my risk risk threshold? Okay, so there, there's an asset there, there's a there's an aspect of risk in this, as well as uh, sort of quantitative measures of sea power. And this, uh, this to me is the most, uh, the most interesting one. I need, to, I need to plan against the most, the force that I am most likely to meet on the field of battle or, or out at sea in this case. That's kind, of, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? I mean, how do I figure out how much of my, of my adversary's force, that force will commit to battle against me? 
that's what I mean. You, you have to you have to really know your know to uh, know your adversary, know what that adversary uh, values, know what the know what commitments it has, where on the map, know know how much it wants its goals in a particular expanse of water. I mean, these are these are things that will determine the proportion of the of its military force and naval force that it will commit to battle. That becomes the standard of adequacy for the for the United States and its and allied forces. So there's there's geopolitical calculations, there's social and cultural factors. There's, there's just a lot a few a human uh, calculations that go into this as well estimating how much the, the adversary wants its goals and therefore how much how much how much magnitude of its military forces it will commit uh, is something that obviously de demands a lot of judgment but yet mahanda demands that we undertake that judgment just to sum up a little bit what he says obviously you need to do the ba the basic blocking and tackling and net assessment again counting counting up stuff trying to and trying to estimate capabilities manpower and, and, and all, all these sort of physical capabilities. Secondly, though, how much, I, I mean, estimate how much cost each contender has to play and what opportunity costs uh, it will pay by undertaking a particular engagement. Opportunity costs, of course, being what I, what I am not doing because I am doing this, this particular engagement. What could I be doing with those resources? So, so you, have to look, you have to look at that whenever measuring a course of action. And lastly, again, thinking, thinking about risk and thinking, thinking, thinking about uh, the commitments that each side has, a, has at work and so on and so forth. So there's a, there's a political and a geopolitical calculation that has to go into this seemingly uh, straightforward quantitative uh, aspect or, or process of trying to measure sea power and figure out who is going to be stronger. And I think I would just leave you with this question. I think this is really sort of in the operational terms. This is where we are. Who wins when a fraction of U.S. forces goes up against the entirety of an enemy's navy, potentially backed up by its air force and backed up by, in, in China's case, by its strategic rocket force, which I've shown you some pictures of. And I think that I think the answer to that question is far from obvious. And I think that's the question that uh, that we really need to exert ourselves to to answer as we try to think about how how large the navy, the marine corps, and the coast guard should be, how they should conduct themselves in action. All the all the all this all this range of questions that goes into executing U.S. strategy in the Indo-Pacific, and it's not this is for this is far from easy, obviously, and that would be the biggest point that I would leave with you. Just uh, don't let people oversimplify things for you, and I think we'll all be smarter. Yeah, exercise a little self, a little bit of self-judgment before taking very very simple judgments about military and naval matters at face value, because a lot of times, a lot of times, and in fact, I would say almost always, the, the uh, story is much more complex. And with that, why don't I uh, why don't I turn it over and field whatever questions you have to have to have for me? These these young ladies, I want you to ask some questions, and or we can do it through the chat as well. Thanks. Thank you, Jim. Uh, tremendous as usual. Are there any questions here in the uh, live audience that would like to uh, ask? Yes, sir. And please use your microphone. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Um, thank you for the presentation, Lieutenant Commander Laraway, uh, U.S. Navy. O oftentimes, these comparisons between the, the Chinese Navy and the U.S. Navy fail to include um, either the Army's SDDC or the Military Sea Lift Command, which not only would perhaps provide a, a truer representation of the U.S.'s naval power, naval force, but also highlights um, the Chinese lack of organic um, logistics specific ships. Yeah. I believe at last count, they only have 15 or 20 dedicated supply ships, whereas military seal of command alone has over 120. Can you explain briefly how uh, their lack of, of, of logistics capabilities would prevent them from uh, projecting power or sustaining operations in theaters outside of the South China Sea, specifically the Indian Ocean, which we know is a, is a region of growing importance for them? Yeah, no, I, I, I couldn't agree. I think, I think my mic is off. Okay. Oh, are we good? Okay. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point, I, I, and I, I mean, it's it's a question that comes up a lot. And I think and I think you're right. I mean, think about the velocity at which China has done what it's done. I mean, it did, only about 25 years ago did it really resolve to make itself into a sea seafaring power of note. Uh, after the after the after the after the missile test uh, off Taiwan during the elections on that island in 1995, I mean, the, uh, President Clinton sent a couple of carrier task forces to the region of uh, or to the area of Taiwan. China, and, the, and this really threw a shock into to, to the uh, Chinese Communist Party government because they could not only could they not threaten our carriers, they couldn't find them. This was really the event that set in motion uh, the the impressive uh, naval buildup that, we, that we've seen ever, ever since then. So again, they, they've concentrated. Uh, 
as they do this, they've concentrated on, on what matters most, which is, which is trying to set matters in order as they see it in places like the South China Sea, and basically in East Asia. They want to, they want to revise the international order in the South China Sea, the East China Sea, and, and so forth, and obviously retake Taiwan, uh, not only because they see it as national territory, but also, but also because it has geopolitical value in breaking through the first island chain. So they, so again, they've, they've set priorities. I mean, strategy is about setting priorities uh, at, at its most basic. And then they, they, reordering uh, events close to home has really been what they they focused on now. So yes, so yes, you're right. They haven't put a lot into the logistics fleet. They haven't done a whole lot in the, with the amphibious fleet until until fairly recent years. But uh, but yeah, so I think that's probably that's probably the next big phase. The uh, interestingly, I, I don't know that they're actually wedded to to specific timelines to make themselves into the world's dominant sea power or at least a peer of ourselves. But they do see they do seem to think that uh, 2049 is the approximate amount of time that they would want to have all these sort of capabilities and become a, a global sea, blue water sea power that can operate throughout the Indian Ocean, Mediterranean Sea. Sometimes they're even talking about bases in the Atlantic on, in, uh, in East Africa. So I think that's probably next after they, after they put things in order uh, close to home, which, which again is what is always going to matter most to, to any military or military or naval power controlling your own surroundings. And then you can think more broadly. But yeah, I think they've come a long way in a short period of time, but yeah, but yes, they've done, they, they have neglected some of those. I, another one that's, another one that's uh, actually a little bit, uh, and I think they're starting to get this right, anti-submarine warfare has not been, it has not been an area of strength. This is another capability they've, they've started working on a lot more. Simply because they understand they need it, that uh, we still have the world's dominant submarine force and we can make things very difficult on them uh, around the first island chain, which is probably where the action will happen in the, in the coming years, if it does. If you believe Admiral uh, Davidson, uh, who last year said it would be about six years before we might have a fight in Taiwan, and that's sort of, that's sort of the timeline. And then after that, they can look, look more broadly uh, at, at other places and think about logistics. They also, and they also, they also have uh, the ability to, to uh, well, they have the, they have the world's largest shipbuilding industry, so uh, you, converting merchantmen and so forth. I think I would I would expect to see them do something like that. But uh, yeah, just a, just a few, just a few random thoughts about China. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Um, I am Commander Carlos Garzón from Ecuadorian Navy. Thanks for your original uh, presentation, China plus uh, zombies. I can not wait to see the how how you relate this these two subjects. And uh, speaking about the capabilities of China, you already say it's not uh, Navy force against Navy force, it's also land-based. I wanna um, give a, a question about uh, the cyber capabilities and the mm. um, uh, outside capabilities will make you think maybe later to uh, do another lecture about uh, zombies Plus aliens, and what's your uh, guess about that? Yeah, there was a movie a few, maybe twenty years ago called Cowboys versus Aliens. Yeah, you can have a lot, of, you can have a lot of fun with those silly things like that. Yeah, I, well, I, you know what? You, you probably haven't yet because you look you're, you're much younger than I am. But uh, when you start when you start getting older, the, I think you start reaching a point at which you sort of age out of new technology, and it starts seeming like magic. The the, the science fiction author author uh, Arthur C. Clarke. Uh, famously said that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistingu indistinguishable from magic. And I think I'm starting to reach. I I'm starting to reach my point uh, with cyber and things like that. Uh, I mean, it's, it's cyber, is, cyber is a fascinating one. It, the uh, and we're starting. Fortunately, the, the Navy is actually put, kind of leaning on the War College to get much better at it. So I think we're sort of, and this is all to the good. We're actually starting to see a, a fair amount of research and gaming going on right around here on cyber. I mean, the I mean, is it a domain? What exactly is cyber? I think we still do, still debate all that all that kind of thing. It is certainly it is certainly something that uh, that China or really any military power can turn to its advantage. Uh, let, let me tell you just a quick uh, a, a quick not an anecdote, but to sort of give you an overview of, of of a concept in Chinese war fighting strategy. They call it systems destruction warfare. The idea being that uh, if your if your adversary fights in a system, whether the system is a fleet, an air force, a an army division, or whatever the case may be. And the and the, the elements of that fleet are some distance from one another, and they are and they are connected probably by the electromagnetic spectrum, but you know could be by sight or anything anything else. If if you can just if you can disrupt what what binds that system together, what have you done? You've basically taken that fleet and you have splintered it into into individual units or individual small small units, which can be overpowered one by one. 
And this is a very Maoist, this is a very Ma Maoist approach. The idea being that if I can break up my adversary's force, I can, I can then pounce on each one of those ships, one of those planes, whatever the, whatever the, the units of combat or power are, and, and, and eliminate them one by one. And thus, uh, over time, I, I trite my adversary so that I, I emerge the stronger competitor and win. It's kind of, it's kind of my, uh, my, my sort of go-to uh, silly sci-fi uh, sci uh, example on this is the, the first episode of the, 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 I think that started in 2005, the, the, the new version of Battlestar Galactica with James Ed, Edward James Olmos as a commander of Dama. That's exactly what happens. That's exactly what the Cylons, the, the inhuman uh, machine, uh, cyborgs, this is what they actually do to launch an attack on a human fleet. They smuggle in a, compu a computer virus into, into the fleet, uh, and disable communications and command and control among the fleet. And what have they done at that point? They can go after the ships one by one. They might not, they might not be the stronger fleet at the outset, but you know what? They've done systems destruction warfare and they destroy that fleet. Except for the one, except for the one surviving ship that, that is not networked and so forth and is and is highly resistant to uh, cyber warfare. So that's I think that's that that's the kind of uh, that's the kind of force multiplier you can get out of cyber warfare. But uh, I think you'd have to get you have to get somebody who's who's a little bit better versed than I am in order to get to get into the real specifics. I don't know about the aliens, but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll think about it. Commander Ross, you have any questions from the uh, audience uh, virtually? Uh, we do. Uh, the first question is: uh, Is it realistic for the U.S. to believe that we can protect Taiwan? I think the I think the way to I think the way to phrase it is that. Uh, I think it is really realistic as long as Taiwan takes uh, ownership of its own destiny. And whenever, whenever, whenever I'm in Taiwan, they always ask this question. I mean, can we actually rely on you, you to come to our assistance in, in time of need? And I always tell them, help us help you. They need to, they need, they need to, they need to, re they're always talking about becoming asymmetric. I mean, look at looking for low cost systems. They can, they can inflict heavy penalties, heavy damage on a stronger adversary, which is what the PLA is going to be for the foreseeable future in the Taiwan Strait and, and, and elsewhere around Taiwan's uh, periphery. But they, but they, and, and, and they do that. They have done some of this, but they, but they have a love affair with, with big glitzy platforms. They're, they've, they, they've recently stood up a, their, their first air wing of the, our most, uh, most advanced uh, F-16 fighters, for example. They pour a lot of resources into that. Whereas what do they really need to do? What does Taiwan need to do strategically in order to defend itself and to assure that U.S. reinforcements and potentially Japanese and Australian reinforcements, given the talk we hear out of, out of those places these days, what does it need to do? China needs a quick victory in the Taiwan Strait in order to prevail. It needs to prevail before we can actually reach the battle zone in, in, in time to reverse aggression. But, uh, and so Taiwan, can, it has low cost options for doing that. It could arm itself to the teeth with anti with anti ship missiles fired from the coastline. Ta Taiwan has very rugged coastline. There's a lot of places to, to uh, conceal such things around around the periphery. So if, they, if it can do that, it can it can make things very difficult for uh, PLA Navy forces trying to come across and land troops on the island, which is what they would have to do in the end. If they can do that, they can slow them down and they can give themselves time. They can also, they can also uh, more or less uh, pay, pay imitation or imitate uh, some of the things the PLA Navy has done, such as with, with small, small uh, coastal patrol craft. They can do stealthy patrol craft. They can secrete them around the periphery, hide them in civilian fishing ports and, and on and on in order, again, to fan out into the Taiwan Strait to make, to make things difficult on, on the PLA Navy, especially the, the vulnerable amphibious uh, transports that, uh, that, that would be needed to carry troops across. They can sow minefields. They can study history. I mean, there, uh, there was a, about 20 years ago, there was a fascinating study out of the RAND uh, Corporation affiliated with the U.S. Air Force. They actually went back and looked at the beaches at Normandy, maps of the beaches at Normandy, and then mapped them on to, to the potential landing beaches in Taiwan. They were almost exactly the same size and almost the exact same configuration, which makes it which makes this very very tough uh, landing site. So again, this so again taking advantage of terrain, uh, low cost weaponry, all these sorts of things are things that uh, Taiwan can do to give itself time. And by the way, the existing more conventional force they need to figure out how they can help us get into the theater. Uh, if they can, if they can take the, the sort of the capital ship fleet to, uh, of which they still have some uh, from the Cold War, if they can figure out how to how to open up a, a corridor to the east so that we can get in, into the battle zone at low cost to the United States and its allies, that actually that actually makes it easier on President Biden, the leaders of Japan, Australia, whoever joins the fight, to actually commit those forces, because the uh, 
I mean, they were, you really have to want your goals a lot in order to combat a lot of forces. If it looks like the, the, we are going to lose a lot of forces in an afternoon in the Taiwan Strait or elsewhere around the periphery, that's going to be very, that's going to be difficult for President Biden to give that order. If Taiwan can reduce the cost to the United States of, of, com of coming to Taiwan's aid, again, that's something that that's something that's going to be very, very powerful for that island. So I painted a pretty bleak picture for you here tonight. I always do, but but we we should also not uh, sell ourselves short. We do have advantages. We have we have we have the terrain along the first island chain between Japan, Taiwan, and the Philippines. I mean that we do have advantages that we that we can exploit if we play our cards right and if we keep our keep our mind on our goals, which is to to balk China's strategy, keep they keep them from coming to the island uh, long enough for us to intervene and hopefully and hopefully overturn aggression. Gary, any other questions? Uh, maybe we'll just go with one more. Um, uh, uh, a watcher asked, is the Chinese mandated integration of the CCP political commissars in their military command structure a significant strength, weakness, or is it negligent? Uh, you, you, do you mean talk about having a political officer on a ship who's equal in rank to a captain? I think that's what, yes, I think that's what they're talking about. I, I would say that's a disadvantage. I mean, I think, I think about being a skipper. I mean, if you have, if you have your own command, if, if you have to look if you have to look over your shoulder for a political a political approval for anything you do, that's going to tend to make you rather gun shy. Uh, it's going to I would say it would tend to make you uh, you know perhaps timid, not very venturesome. You have to you have to stay within the political the political boundaries set by by your masters back in Beijing. I would say I think that was a, a significant uh, uh, a significant uh, uh, drawback for for the Soviet Navy during the Cold War. They had the very same same arrangement as well. We, we we here in the West and our and our friends who come to here to the War College we're we're pretty permissive about uh, uh, encouraging encouraging our subordinates to go out and exercise their initiative. I think but I think putting a political officer on a on a submarine or on a ship and, or so I think it's going to take away a lot of that initiative. So again, we do we do have advantages. Uh, I would say that's actually a self defeating thing that the Chinese have done, but I, th I think they I think they're doing it just because of who they are. Dr. Holmes, thank you very much. It was excellent. Thanks for coming out.